I'm somewhat emotional to be here at Deutsche Bank. You know it as a world leader in investment banking and asset management, but I know it from its proactive promotion of women. Women in the workplace, and I've actually spoken about women in business at its headquarters in Frankfurt, uh, Germany, which is my country of origin. I know it too from its landmark partnership with Autistica. We have a thing outside, the last autism charity that I have founded. Actually, it's not the last, but it is the latest. 2015 will be on the record of the year of mass migration to Europe. More refugees than since the end of World War II. And I came to this country as an unaccompanied child refugee just before its start in 1939. My mother put me on a train in Vienna, part of the kinder transport which saved nearly 10,000 children, Jewish children, from Nazi Europe. At five years old, clutching the hand of my nine-year-old sister, I had only the vaguest idea of where I was being sent to. What is England and why am I going there? I am only alive because so long ago I was saved by generous strangers. I was lucky, uh, doubly lucky to be reunited with my birth parents after the war, but sadly, I never bonded with them again. But I've done more in the seven decades since that miserable day with it, that my mother put me on that train than I would ever have believed possible. And I love England, my adopted country, with a passion that perhaps only someone who has lost their human rights can feel. I decided to make my life one that was worth saving. And then I just got on with doing that. Let me take you back to the early 1960s. To get past the gender issues of the day, I set up my own high-tech software company, one of the UK's first such startups. It was a company of women, a company for women, an early social business. And people laughed at the very idea, you can't sell software. At that time, it was given away free with the hardware. And they laughed even louder at my crusade for women. Although women were then coming out of the universities with decent degrees, there was a ceiling of toughened glass to our progress. And I'd hit that ceiling too often. I wanted opportunities for women. I recruited professionally qualified women who had left the computer industry on marriage or when their first child was expected and structured them into a home working organization, a 20th century cottage industry. And we pioneered the, the concept of women going back into the workforce after a career break a whole lot of new work methods, the concept of a cafeteria of benefits, all kinds of flexible working, job sharing, profit sharing, and later co-ownership when I managed to get a quarter of the shares of the company into the hands of the workforce at no cost to anyone but me. So I was a disruptor and I was pushing HR limits in a number of ways. For years, I was the first woman this, the only woman that. Uh, in those days, women couldn't work on the stock exchange or, or drive a bus. I couldn't even open a bank account for the company without my husband's permission. And my generation of women fought the battles for the right to work, the right to serve, and for equal pay. In my first job, when handsome young men offered to carry my equipment for me, 
I used to reply aggressively, I believe in equal pay and will carry my own things. Nowadays, aged 82, I sigh. Oh, how kind. Thank you so much. <laughs> Nobody expected much from women in work or in society because all the expectations were about home and family responsibilities. I couldn't accept that and so challenge the conventions of the day, even to the extent of changing my name from Stephanie to Steve in my business development letters so that I was through that door and shaking hands before anyone realized that he was a she. My company called Freelance Programmers, which was exactly what it was, couldn't have started smaller with 100 pounds equivalent on the dining room table, uh, financed by my own labor, and basically taking a second mortgage on the family home. My interests were scientists, I'm a mathematician. Uh, the market was commercial, things such as payroll, which I found boring. So I went for operational research work, which was both intellectually interesting and at the same time was valued by the client. Things like scheduling freight trains, timetabling buses, stock control, lots and lots of stock control, and gradually the work came in. And we disguised the domestic and part-time nature of the workforce by offering fixed prices, uh, one of the first to do so. Who would have guessed that the programming of the black box flight recorder for supersonic Concorde was done by a bunch of women working in our own homes? An early project was to develop um, software standards of management control protocols. Software was and is a maddeningly hard to pin down activity. So that was enormously valuable. Uh, we used the standards ourselves. We even paid to update them over the years, and eventually they were adopted by NATO. Our programmers remember only women, including gay and transgender, worked with pencil and paper to develop flow charts defining the job to be done. And they then wrote code, usually machine code, but sometimes binary, uh, which was sent by mail to a data center for punching onto cards or paper tape, and then repunching in order to verify that process. All this prior to submission to the mainframe computer, and that was programming in 1962. In 1975, um, 13 years from the company's startup, equal opportunities legislation came in in Britain, which made our pro-female policies illegal. So as an example of unintended consequences, we had to let the men in. When I started my company, um, the men said, how interesting, uh, because it only works because it's small. And as the company grew, the, the same men commented, yes, it's sizable now, but of no strategic interest. And later still, when the company was valued at over $3 billion, and I'd made 70 of the staff into millionaires, they commented, well done, Steve. <laughs> you can always tell ambitious women by the shape of our heads. They're flat on top from being patted patronizingly. <laughs> and we have larger feet to stand away from the kitchen sink. Women still have a long way to go. There are two factors, really, that account for the company's growth long-term growth, both to do with control. Firstly, I decided to spread ownership as widely as possible throughout the firm. 
And secondly, when many entrepreneurs do fail, I realized my own limitations and brought in professional managers to take the group forward. In 1978, I was writing reports on developing software in India. And it was 1998 before that happened, by which time things had moved on from access to uh, a cheap workforce to access to a skilled workforce in short supply. And when the company was taken over in 2007, half the 8,500 staff were working actually in India. It takes months, years really, to make an impact on most worthwhile tasks. And every time I've pushed a limit back, it has taken years. I was working on succession planning for 11 years, about the same time to get the company into co-ownership. None of the worthwhile strategic things just happened. I had to struggle for them. Let me share with you my secrets of success. Always surround yourself with first-rate people and people that you like, and I don't mean people like you, and choose any partners very carefully. The other day, uh, when I said my husband's an angel, uh, a woman complained. You're lucky, she said. Mine's still alive. <laughs> If success were easy, we'd all be millionaires. And in my case, it came in the midst of family, tragedy, and indeed crisis. Our late son, Giles, was an only child, a beautiful, contented baby. And then a two and a half, like a changeling in a fairy story, he lost the little speech that he had uh, and turned into a wild, unmanageable toddler. Uh, not the terrible twos. Um, he was profoundly autistic and he never spoke again. Families affected by autism can be overwhelmed by stress. And often the child that is growing up is so confused by the world around them that as, that as with Giles's case, um, they start to self-harm and become violent. So Giles was the first resident in the first home of the first charity that I set up to pioneer services for autism. But what many families realize as they battle to get their children the services and support they need is that without further research, autistic people are condemned to lives that, where they are misunderstood, not supported, and tragically, where they die young. And this is why I founded Autistica, to get families living with autism the answers they need. Giles died of an epileptic seizure about 17 years ago now. Recent research um, shows that these tragic early deaths from epilepsy are shockingly common in autism. Indeed, it's the leading cause of death. And why should 1% of the population be treated as second-class citizens? Autistica's lifesaver appeal seeks to under understand why autistic people are dying before their 40th birthday and to give them long, healthy, and happier lives. And generous supporters are pivotal to helping Autistica give today's children longer, healthier, and happier lives. I've now learned to live without Giles, without his need of me. I've tried to use our family's terrible experiences for, for good by investing most of my wealth and part of my time, all of my time really, 
um, in autism care, education and research. So if any of you are thinking about how to spend your retirement pots, please come and see me after. <laughs> Philanthropy not only gives great joy and intellectual fulfillment, but it's one of the few ways to uh, enjoy losing everything. I started Autistic Care 11 years ago now um, to address strategic health issues. And it's now a medium-sized charity, uh, professionally managed with strong corporate governance and a wildly impressive scientific advisory board. It's part of the James Lind Alliance, which brings together patients, carers and clinicians, and is accredited with the Association for Medical Research Charities. Above all, it cares about the 700,000 people with autism in the UK. And all support is most welcome. On Wednesday, uh, Autistica had an autistic child, age seven, and he looked like an angel, um, open the market as part of Autism Awareness Week. Entrepreneurs pursue several goals simultaneously. They like doing new things and making new things happen. I've just started a, a three-year think tank for autism, and it's a joy for me to always have something to get up for in the morning. Philanthropy is all that I do now. I need never worry about getting lost because many charities would quickly come and find me. It's one thing to have ideas, as most people who are here will know, making them happen demands a hefty push as well as finance, and a 24 by 7 commitment that borders on the obsessive. So it's just as well that I'm a workaholic. Work is not just something I do when I'd rather be doing something else. And there is a beauty in work when we do it properly and in humility. Thank you very much.